Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jennifer. This week is Disney Week. We will be discussing four fantabulous Disney shows, starting with Raven's House, which is basically the sequel to the very popular old show called That So Raven which came out in 2003. That's So Raven was basically a sitcom about this great teenage girl who is called, obviously, Raven, and she had the ability to see into the future, which got her into all kinds of trouble. She had her two friends, Eddie and Chelsea, who knew about her psychic abilities, and, of course, her family. Everybody else was oblivious. Now, usually she had the knack for interpreting her visions the wrong way. Like, she would see her visions, but then think that they meant something other than what they meant. And because of this, she got into all kinds of shenanigans as a kid. Now, in the series That's So Raven, Raven had a boyfriend named Devon, and apparently they ended up getting married And they had two kids, Booker and Nia. They were twins, and they are very adorable. And that is basically what the series Raven's House is about. It is about Raven being a mother and taking care of her twin children. Not only that, but Chelsea's also in the series. She has a son named Levi. Her husband's name was Garrett Grayson, but the two of them had their disagreements when he tried to take over her business and well he went to jail for that so she's been having to take care of Levi on her own but Raven being the awesome best friend that she is allows Levi and Chelsea to live with her inside their apartment building their next door neighbor's name is Tess she is Nia's best friend And she's really cute. I really like Tess's character. The series basically follows the unique family on their different adventures that they go through every day. Now, normally you would think that probably this means that it's kind of a typical, normal, well, sitcom. But no, because like his mom, Booker can also see into the future. And just like his mom, Booker is terrible at interpreting his visions. During the first course of the series, Booker didn't really want to tell his mom about his visions, and the only persons who knew were Levi, later his sister, found out, and then Tessa. But eventually they did tell Raven, and then she told them about her visions. Everybody came out, kind of, about their visions, and it was cool. Even Devon found out. So everybody knows about the visions that live in the family. Eventually, Garrett came back and is no longer in jail. And he gets to visit Levi sometimes, but not that often. Same thing goes for Devon. I mean, 
Raven and Devon are divorced, so that means that you don't get to see your kids all the time. So apparently, Raven was too much to handle for even Devon. And I saw this in the original series. They did have their ups and downs, but they were always really cute, and I liked them as a couple. So when I found out that they ended up having children when I first started watching the series, I was proud. Very much so proud. Either way, it's a good series. I've been watching it for the entirety of the show, and now it is on its fourth season. It came out in 2017, and it's been running a course of having a good amount of episodes every season. The first season had 13 episodes, second season 21 third, 26, and the fourth has 15 at the moment, but it'll probably have a lot more. Now, the episode I'm going to talk about for this week is actually an episode that people can relate to because it was all about quarantine. The episode is called Bless This Tess. Now, the episode basically begins with Tess and the rest of the children learning a new dance craze video. With quarantine being a thing, there is really nothing much for the kids to do except for do stuff at home and peruse the internet. One of those internet things they caught up to was the love of dance craze and imitating those dances. Now, when Tess leaves, Raven talks to Nia saying that Since quarantine is a thing and, well, Tess has been spending more time with her dad when he comes home and her dad works as a truck driver, which is one of the people who is in the front line, she fears that maybe it's for the best that Tess doesn't come over as often. Just coming and going might be dangerous for the family and for her too. So this makes Nia really sad. This is her best friend. She doesn't want to tell her best friend she can't come over anymore. And then Booker has a vision that Tess is going to move in with them. And it's going to be great. So that is what they propose to their moms. That Tess needs to live with them. That's the best solution for everyone. That way she's not coming and going. Instead she's sticking around and Everyone can get to see each other and interact and be friendly, but not be dangerous. So, Raven and Chelsea agree. And Tess moves in for two weeks. But then the kids realize that Tess is the kind of person who takes care of the people she lives with. She does a lot of chores, she cooks a lot, and this is making them look bad. For one... Booker is kind of a lazy boy who likes to be less helpful with chores. And, well, Levi does do chores better than Booker does. He's still a little bit lazy. He's the youngest of the group anyway. Nia's the one who's been more productive. She's actually trying to help out the environment and everything. I really like Nia's character. Either way... All three of the kids were talking and thinking that maybe uh, Tess living there isn't the best thing. Nia's concern is because Tess and her aren't spending as much time with each other as she thought they would be. On the other side of the plot line, Raven's trying to find some time to herself because she's got quarantine claustrophobia. Everybody's home all the time and she can't find any time to herself. She's working with Chelsea at their Ravenous fashion thing. And she's also sees the kids all the time. She can't really find time to herself. And Chelsea doesn't really get it. But Chelsea's always had a hard time understanding when she goes too far. <laughs> so the kids were talking about Tess. And the sad thing is that Tess overheard the whole thing. So Tess was thinking, maybe I should just leave. But Raven stopped her and 
told the kids that they need to fix this because this doesn't help anybody. And I agree. Being cruel to friends just because they make you look bad is no way to act. And we also found out why Tess does the things she does. Her parents are very much so essentials to the world. Her dad's a truck driver, as I mentioned, and her mom is a nurse. On the front lines all the time taking care of people. They're essential. So she was raised as being a hard worker, and that's just how she is. She takes care of people. So I admire that about her. And they should not feel threatened about her. They should embrace it. Which is basically what Raven told the kids. So, they come up with the idea to have Essential Test Day. Which basically is a day where they showed off that they learned the dance steps without Tess's help. So that she can take it easy. And she really enjoyed their dance display and joined in at the end too. And when they made a mess with the confetti... Who should help clean it up but the kids instead? And also, Chelsea helped out Raven by setting up the scoot car. Well, you see, the scoot car is basically what Raven's other job was before they started the fashion business. And so they basically, like, didn't need the job anymore because, well, quarantine means you can't really be driving people around that you don't know. So Raven was used in the scoot car as a way to get away from everybody. But Chelsea, being Chelsea, set it up so that Raven could really enjoy it. Audiobooks, beautiful decorations, and muffins along with fancy drinks. All stuff that Raven loves. And of course Chelsea knows these things because they've been friends forever. Anyway, so the episode ended with Everybody appreciating what they have and what they've gained. And I'm glad that that's the way that it ended because quarantine has made a lot of good and bad things happen. I think it has brought families closer together in ways, but of course it's killed so many people and we need to learn from it. If the government had told us more about what was coming then maybe less people would have died. But now we need to get vaccinated and keep our distance, but still be there for the people we love and care about. Just like with Tess, it's important to take care of those that we live with. And that's just how I see it. Either way, this was a really good episode, and all of the episodes of Raven's House have been awesome. The actors and actresses and the directors all do a great job with the show. The show was created by Jed Alinoff and Scott Thomas. The stars of Raven's House are Raven Simone as Raven Baxter. She has always been a favorite character of mine. I loved her in movies like... Dr. Doolittle, and all kinds of other really great movies, and I also love her in the original That's So Raven. Isaac Ray Brown as Booker Baxter Carter, which is basically Raven's son. Navina Robinson is Nia Baxter Carter, the twin. Jason Mayboom as Levi Grayson. Chelsea's son, and Sky Katz as Tess, the best friend, and Annalise Vanderpool as Chelsea Grayson, the best friend. <sighs> we also have Jonathan McDale as Devon Carter, ex husband of Raven. And we have John O. Wilson as Garrett Grayson. 
all of which are great actors and actresses. And I really like the show. So, as far as episodes go, I definitely think that this one was a success. It taught people about how you need to appreciate those that come into your lives and also to be cautious with quarantine being still around no matter what some people tell you. Anyway, it is about time for our first break. When we come back, we will be discussing the good new show that is called Home Economics is on ABC. And I think that it will be good. After all, a lot of the ABC funny shows have been great fun for me to watch. There has not been a new comedy on the ABC network for a while, and I'm looking forward to trying this one. But until then, I hope you will enjoy the commercials and look forward to finding out what home economics is all about. I know I am looking forward to finding out that answer. See you in a few. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Hello and welcome back to the GSMC Television Podcast. I am your host, Jennifer. Before the break, we were discussing Raven's House, a wonderful show on Disney. And now we will be discussing another great show on, well, it's not on Disney Channel, but it's also by Disney. It is on ABC, which I didn't always know was owned by Disney, but now I do. And when I figured it out, I felt a little stupid. Anyway, the show that I'm talking about is called Home Economics. It had its pilot episode quite recently. In fact, the pilot episode premiered on April 7th, 2021. Now, as you all probably know, if you watch ABC, ABC just finished out one of its best series called Modern Family. And now... They needed something to kind of fill that gap. Home economics feels like what they're using to kind of fill that gap. Let me explain. So the series is basically... It's inspired by the life of co-creator Mitchell Colton. Home economics takes a look at the heartwarming yet super comfortable and sometimes frustrating relationship among three adult siblings, one in the 1%, one middle class, and one barely holding on. Interesting enough, that's not the order of their siblingry. Now, let me explain what I'm saying. So, there are three siblings. The youngest is Connor, and he is in the 1%. He is so rich that he is now currently living in Matt Damien's house. Well, his old house. He bought his house. That is impressive. Because Matt Damien's an actor, and at the end of one of the episodes, they said that he was in We Bought a Zoo, which I really liked that movie. It was really interesting. Either way, this house is very beautiful and very impressive. We get to see it in the first episode, and... Oh my gosh, if I had a house like that, mm, I would be just overwhelmingly happy, but I wouldn't know what to do with all that space. (laughs) It's just, wow, so many rooms, a built-in maid, you have those tiny little go-karts, and one of those smart toilets. It's like, wow, 
And the daughter's room is, wow, it has so many pictures of the little girl. It's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Connor has a daughter and she's so cute. Anyway, so basically that is Connor's life. And then we got the one middle class, which is Tom, the oldest brother. Now, he was the author of best-selling novels, but now he's having trouble with his last book not selling any copies, and he's currently working on another book, which, get this, is all about his family. And, well, of course, he hadn't told his family about that because it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, hey, um, I'm going to bring this up at random, but my next book is all about y'all. That's right. I'm releasing your embarrassing stories to the public. Please don't hate me. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway, that is his life. And he also has three kids. Two are barely out of diapers. And one is like older and it's the girl. And it's just like, wow, you have three kids and you're just one middle class. Yikes. And then the final sibling is Sarah. She's the middle sibling and she is, well, she's married to her beautiful wife, Denise, and they have two kids, but they're barely holding on because Sarah lost her job and, well, Denise is a teacher, but still... Let's be honest, teachers don't make a lot. So, yeah. That is bad. I mean, at least in Modern Family, the gay couple was doing a lot better. I'm sorry, it's just like, looking at their financial problems, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I feel so sorry for this beautiful couple. They're so sweet, and I like their kids. But they live in this small house cramped little place where their upstairs is just up above one of their other rooms and it's just like you had to make your upstairs that's how bad off you are well I don't really have an upstairs myself either but still that's just yikes poor them anyway so that is the family and yeah it's a really cool series. I think that the actors and actresses do a good job. And those actors and actresses are Topher Grace as Tom, Caitlin McGee as Sarah, the middle sibling, Jimmy Tatro as Connor, the one who's like so financially successful, it's scary, Carla. Suzanne as Marina, which is Tom's wife. She's spunky. I like her character. Shashir Zamata as Denise, who is Sarah's wife. Shiloh Behrman as Gretchen, who is the daughter of Connor. Like, the one who's so well off. <laughs> Jordi Curret as Samaya, Sarah and Denise's daughter. Jacoby Swan as Calvin, Sarah and Denise's son. And Chloe Jo Rotri as Camilla, Tom and Marina's daughter. So that is it for the actors and actresses. And yes, as I said, this is a really good show. But... That is not all that goes into a really good show, the actors and actresses, and the main plot. You have to do good with the pilot. And the pilot is basically this. So because Tom didn't do so well with his last book, he has to ask Connor for a loan. And, well, that's embarrassing. Connor's his youngest brother, and the youngest sibling should look up to the older sibling not be asked by the older sibling for a loan. Hey, it's not Tom's fault that he wasn't as successful as Connor. Well, 
Maybe it is. Oh, I said that wrong. <laughs> anyway, so he's thinking in the back of his mind whether or not he should ask for a loan. And then Sarah, in the back of her mind, is asking, should I tell them that I got laid off? That I got fired? I no longer have a job. I am so embarrassed about that. So both of the other siblings are embarrassed and don't want to tell Connor anything about what is happening to them. But when they finally do come out, here's the big twist. Connor's having some problems of his own. His wife, Emily, no longer his wife. She cheated on him and he cheated on her. So they are getting divorced and he is trying to figure out how he's going to handle not only telling his daughter about it, but also living life as a single dad. I mean, you may be successful in money, but in marriage and parenting, well, he's at the bottom among his siblings. Not to mention, he was going to give their parents a vacation trip for Thanksgiving, and, well, they just found out about it that day, and, well, that created an argument, and, yeah. So, <laughs> that was all kinds of funny. <laughs> but, I like this show. The sibling fight, the sibling banter, it reminds me of any other family that has siblings, and you just know that in the end, they do realize how much they love each other, because Connor gives Tom the loan, and I think that Sarah feels better about herself knowing that she is not the only one with problems, because she literally said in the episode, I thought you two had it all figured out, and I was the one who always had all the problems. Well, not true. So I think that everything's gonna turn out well for these siblings. Now we just need Tom to be honest and tell them that his book that he's writing is all about them. I can't wait to see that train wreck of an episode. <laughs> but the next episode that I did watch was the second one, which was even more funny. Tom continues to work on his book about the siblings, hoping that when they find out that it is about their family, they will not be mad. <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that. I think that they will be mad at first, but then they will later on think it's cool and might even, well, try to make certain that they um have input on it. Input that, well, Connor apparently needs when he has to make the toast at their friend Swag's wedding. And it's funny because Swag used to have a crush on Sarah, before Sarah figured out that she was gay. And that's just, wow. <laughs> Awkward. Anyway, so Swags was their best childhood friend, and he had this great idea for this belt that has this little belt buckle, and you open the belt buckle, and you can store food in it. And you can also put a glass on top of it, and, well, of course Tom thought it was a stupid idea, but Connor invested in it, and what do you know? It made a lot of money. <laughs> so that's that's right there is kind of funny and awkward. And a lot of the times when they were little, Tom would do Connor's homework. So just now, Connor's asking, Hey, Tom, can you please help me out with the toast for the best man? Because I'm terrible at writing. So they end up doing that together, but... Well, Tom thinks he's basically being used because he's indebted to Connor because of the loan. When we find out later on, in reality, Connor just wanted it as an excuse to hang out with his big brother more, which I thought was adorable. On the other hand, we got Sarah and Denise are like looking at this wedding and, well, Denise at first is just wishing that the two of them actually had a wedding. You know, it's hard for gays to have anything when people take this kind of reaction to them in general. And I think that that's just terrible. They're just like anybody else. So, I thought this was kind of funny. They kind of hijack the wedding of Swag and his wife and get their first dance with it. 
Tom even makes a wedding video for them, and it's just funny from the stuff that happened at Swag's wedding. And <laughs> Swag's wife is like, we are never inviting them to get together again. This family's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it was so funny when Connor and Tom had their little argument about the speech during the toast was just, oh my gosh, I, I crack up. This show has the potential to be a great show. And I can't wait to find out what happens next because it's funny. I like the characters and I like the plot lines. <laughs> it's just really good. And I am impressed, ABC. You did a great job. I don't think this show can be as great as Modern Family, but it still has the potential to be a good series. And I can't wait to watch more. But for now, we'll just have to give it our thumbs up approval. I think that I liked the second episode more because it was funnier and, well, we got more of an in-depth show of how the siblings work. Also, I love weddings. I just recently went to my cousin's wedding and this just made me think of it. And yeah, so that's why I really liked this second episode and I look forward to more episodes from Home Economics. So I give props to the writers and the actors. Good job, you guys. Now, we are coming up on our next break. When we come back, we are going to be talking about the season finale of a great show on Disney Plus called Falcon and the Winter Soldier. As long as you have seen all of the Marvel movies, you'll know what I'm talking about. But until then, enjoy these commercials and I will see you in a few. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Television Podcast. I am your host, Jennifer. Before the break, we were talking about two wonderful series, Raven's House and Home Economics. Now, we will talk about another great Disney show that has been premiering on Disney Plus for the past couple of weeks. It started on... March 19, 2021 and ended... April 23rd. Well, with its season finale, it might have more episodes, but all I know is that The Falcon and the Winter Soldier has been awesome. Yes, that is what I am talking about. Now, I hope that all of you have seen Endgame before I reveal this. You see, at the end of Endgame, we had a epic heartbreak for Three characters that were great. I mean, Iron Man died. <laughs> it was beautiful, but he did die. And our very own Black Widow died to get one of the stones. So that was just sad enough. And then Cap went back to return the stone so that we wouldn't have our whole conflict when it came to time travel affecting the present day. And instead of coming back to the present... Cap stays behind to be with Peggy. 
And it is so beautiful, the fact that after all that Captain America has been through, all he wanted to do was be with Peggy Carter ever since he woke up. And now he has that opportunity, and he takes it, by golly. And because of that, we don't have a Captain America anymore. And who does he give the shield to? He gives it to his friend Sam, the Falcon. And yes, amazing and wonderful idea because Sam is a great Avenger. He's a great guy. But some people will look at that and say, wait, he can't be Captain America. He's black. And to people like that, I say, shut your mouth. Black people are wonderful people. I have amazing friends that are black. And we should not be racist. But there it is. We had a wonderful president who was black. Barack Obama. And I think that people should stop looking at the color of someone's skin and realize the person inside. And basically... Sam getting past that and becoming the new Captain America, at least that's what I hope, is what this series is all about. Plus, he's working with our Winter Soldier, Bucky, who's working with his own problems. I mean, now he's no longer brainwashed and he's trying to atone for what he did when he was brainwashed Winter Soldier. It's hard for him. I mean, when he was the Winter Soldier, he was completely and utterly under the control of Hydra and killing people that he never wanted to kill, not to mention Stark's parents. And yeah, that was one of the main conflicts that happened in Civil War. So that's just the conflict that we are stating in this series. Not to mention we had this new guy named John Walker who becomes the new Captain America, and no, he's not good at it. He's not... I don't care if he's a decorated soldier. He's no Captain America. And he proves that in the last episode that I watched before I watched the final episode. You see, he was fighting against these new super soldiers. I mean... Winter Soldier and Falcon were fighting against them too. They were trying to keep the world from turning back to normal. See, during the big snap, half the population got just basically disappeared. So this group wants it to stay the way it was during the snap when everybody was just one people one world no borders nothing everybody came together to help each other but then when end game ended and everybody came back well that resulted in people coming back to their homes to find others in their houses and so the government leaders wanted to bring everything back to the way it used to be before the snap and this group doesn't want that they want everything to be well of course just stay this way and people learn to live with each other and well this group is called the flag smashers and their leader is carly and well they wouldn't be that much of a problem if they weren't super soldiers. Yes, this whole group of people became super soldiers. We still don't even know how. I mean, I do because I watched the full last episode, but I'm not going to spoil that. Either way, the Flag Smashers have been causing problems. They're terrorists and not exactly setting the best example. And, well, Carly ended up killing... John's friend who is like his partner and so of course 
Walker got really mad about that. And he also got a hold of one of the serums and he became a super soldier. So when you become a super soldier, your body and everything about you, it gets enhanced, but his anger got enhanced too. So he ended up killing one of the group members. And well, that resulted in him having his Captain America suit taken from him and no longer being credited as the new Captain America. And that basically is what happened in the last episode. And frankly, I think that this series has been a smashing success. I loved every minute of it. But of course, my favorite characters would have to be the main characters. Like, I loved Anthony Mikey as Sam Wilson or Falcon. And I also really love Sebastian Stan as James Bucky Barnes or our Winter Soldier. And then we had Wyatt Russell. Hey, my last name is Russell. That's funny. As John Walker slash Captain America. But yeah, no longer Captain America. And Carly, our villain, was played by Aaron Kellyman. And she did a great job. Now, the other person that was very important was our very own Emily Van Camp, who played Sharon Carter, a.k.a. the relative of Peggy Carter. And if you all watched and paid attention to one of the Captain America movies, Captain America and the Winter Soldier to be precise, she helped Captain America escape with the shield and um, she did a lot of really awesome things back when we didn't even know that Hydra was deep involved with shield. So yeah, she has been in hiding for those actions. So she was promised by Falcon to get a pardon if she helped out the gang. So now we have to go to the beginning of this episode. Now that we have found out the great actors and actresses, the time has come to discuss the great plot of the season finale. So, it starts out with the whole big-time vote happening to see if they should bring the world back to the way it was before the snap or during the snap and just make kind of a way to for everybody to get along and of course the GIC vote is just like um something that Carly and her gang want to stop and they take out the power and try and take all the voters as hostages but our winter soldier and new Captain America slash Falcon will not let that happen yes Sam arrives in his awesome new suit where he's not only Captain America but also the Falcon at a group kind of thing that's so cool. I mean, Captain America might have had the power of the super soldier, but he could never fly. But our man Falcon America, he can fly. He can fly. And it's so cool. All the fight scenes are so awesome in this episode. And I loved seeing Sam just fight the good fight. I loved seeing our Winter Soldier fight the good fight. And the voters were able to be evacuated from the building into trucks and a helicopter. Hindsight, the helicopter wasn't the best idea because out of nowhere, one of the members of the Flag Smashers got a hold of the helicopter and now it is up to Sam to save all those people. Using his robot, now completely fixed, he finds out that one of the hostages has training as a pilot. So he uses his shield to get that hijacker out of the helicopter into the Hudson River and then the person who is a pilot takes the controls and helps land them safely onto the ground. That was an awesome scene. I also really liked the scene when Sam and one of the other members were fighting with, like, wrestling moves. It was so cool to see him fight like that. And he used the 
awesome shield to his advantage, and that was that was really cool. I loved everything about all those fight scenes. Not to mention, let's take a look at how the Winter Soldier's doing, and he is doing an awesome job as like fighting against the uh, super soldiers who are trying to take control of the trucks that have the hostages in them. And who should also come, but here's John Walker trying to get his revenge against Carly and her group. And, well, he demonstrates again how much he is not qualified to be Captain America because at one point he was focusing completely on his fighting against Carly instead of trying to save the people who were in the car from the fire that was started earlier to take out another car see there are like two cars one car was needing to be set on fire to distract our winter soldier but then he saved that car but the fire was still active so that was going to take out the second car but then john walker realizes that he wants to save the people more than he wants to defeat carly so he abandons his mission to get his revenge for that partner of his because, well, if you ask me, his partner probably would not want him to let other people die just so he could get his revenge. I mean, Lamar Hawkins, that was his partner's name, really looked up to John and he would be ashamed if John just let all those voters die just because he was trying to destroy Carly. No, that is not what their friendship was all about. They wanted to save this country, not just go all out on a revenge trip. So when John Walker saves the voters, I was so proud of him. Well, he didn't save them all to by himself. I mean, he tried to, but then the super soldiers kind of attacked him and the car was going to fall off of the construction zone. Everybody was going to die, but who should save them? But our main man, Sam. And now it is a fight to the death or a fight to the finish between Sam and Carly. Who will win? Who will lose? You're going to have to find that out for yourself by watching the episode. I have to say that I have really thoroughly enjoyed this series. I think it was great. I think that it deserves props. And I hope there's another season because I enjoyed every minute of it. And I can't wait to find out what happens next for Marvel. Because Marvel is doing a really good job. Now... It is almost time for our next break. When we get back, we will be talking about the newest Star Wars series on Disney+. Plus. The reasoning for this will be explained after the break. Until then, hope you enjoy the commercials, and I will see you in a few minutes. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Television Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer. Before the break, we were talking about three great Disney shows. Raven's House, Home Economics, and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. They were awesome, and I loved talking about them. Now, we will talk about the newest series on Disney+, Plus, entitled 
Star Wars The Bad Batch. Now, if you all watched my previous episode, you'll know that I said I was going to talk about the season finale of Amphibia, but something happened with scheduling, so it did not premiere last week like it was supposed to, which means I have to pick another series. Luckily for me, there was a brand new series premiering on Disney+. Plus. I had no idea it was premiering. It was premiering on May 4th because it's May the 4th be with you. Basically, it's Star Wars Day. It's an awesome new series about the Bad Batch. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Star Wars, the Clone Wars series, the Bad Batch is basically a group of defective clones that have, well, they're defective, but they also have enhanced programming that make them unique and useful. The leader of this group is called Hunter, and he has advanced tracking capabilities. Then we've got Tech, who's like super smart. Wrecker, who's just really good at wrecking things and blowing things up, and he's really muscular and stuff. The last one is called Crosshairs, and he's really good at shooting. Not to mention there's another one that joined their batch because he became more machine than clone due to the, well programming that was done to him during the Clone Wars, and his name is Echo. And that is it for those characters of the Bad Batch, and they are all played by D. Bradley Baker, because since they're clones, they're going to sound alike. We also have another new character named Omega, who turns out to be a young female clone working as a medical assistant on Kamino, which is the clone's home planet, under Nail C. And I love her character. She's so adorable. She played by Michelle Ang, and, oh, she's such a great addition to the show. When I first saw the preview, I was like, wait, what? This show is just about the clones? Clones get annoying. I want Jedi. But when I saw her character, I was like, maybe this show has potential. And I'm glad I watched it because it does have potential. It's really cool. So the first episode of the series is all about near the end of the Clone Wars, the Bad Batch are sent to Keller to a Jedi Master, Dipa Bil Abba, and her Padwan, Caleb Dume. Now, if you've watched Star Wars Rebels, you know that Caleb is actually Kanan, which means that this is actually the scene that we've been wanting to see how Kanan survived Order 66, which is about to be initiated. All the clones are told by the dreaded Emperor to kill all Jedi, and they turn on Depa, and of course, the Bad Batch group are supposed to do it too, but because of their programming, they aren't as compelled as the rest of the clones to kill all the Jedi. Hunter runs after Kanan, and so does Crosshair. And, well, Hunter lets Kanan go. Thanks to this action, Kanan survives. And, of course, Crosshairs is mad at Hunter the entire episode because he did not do what he was supposed to. Somehow, Crosshairs' chip is still not as active as the other clones, but a bit more active than the rest of his group. So, they go back to Kamino and learn that the Empire has replaced the Republic. And they meet Omega, who is a female defective clone. Soon after, Admiral Tarkin, who basically was there when the Separatists captured Echo and turned him into, well, what he has become, which is more machine than clone. And, well, already because of that, Echo doesn't trust Admiral Tarkin And he shouldn't, because as you all remember, Admiral Tarkin's in Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. He was there to intimidate Leia. He is played by Stefan 
Stanton. And, well, he's there to tell the Prime Minister of Kamino that we probably won't need your clones as much as we did before because the war's over. He's saying that, well, we're just probably going to use hired help. And it's like, well, the clones are a bit more efficient than hired help. And the Prime Minister is played by Bob Bredgen. And, well, Admiral Tarkin's like, we'll see. I'm going to evaluate all your clones, including the Bad Batch. So, another character that is a creature of Kamino is called Nail Say. She's like a clone processor. She, um, basically is a scientist and she's a medical person. She was the one who was taking care of Omega. And she's played by Gwendolyn Yale. And she was really nice. I liked her character. And I think she and the Prime Minister cared about the clones. And the reason why I say that is because they were sent to a planet the Bad Batch after their evaluation because they passed it, but General Tarkin is all, like, suspicious of our group. So he sends them off to go take care of a group of insurgents. But it's really just a group of civilians and Republic fighters who really don't like or agree with the new way that the world is shaping out to be. They don't like the Empire. They want everything to go back to being the Republic. Smart people. Either way, Hunter makes another call that Crosshair does not like. He doesn't want to destroy those poor civilians. So they go back to Kamino, mostly because they need to go back for Omega when they find out that she's one of them. Another clone with different abilities and stuff they don't know what those abilities are yet but they know that she's a defective clone so they go back and they get arrested crosshair gets basically his inhibitor chip enhanced so he turns against his bad batch group they do manage to get a hold of omega and they manage to flee because their fighting skills are just all that. And it was really cool. Omega was helpful to them. And I liked that first episode. It was an hour long. And it was just well worth it. And yeah. I enjoyed every minute of it. I'm hoping that the rest of the episodes are just as cool. And that brings me to the second episode. And it is entitled Cut and Run. Now, if you all kept following Star Wars, the Clone Wars, you'd know that Cut is the name given to a clone that has basically become a deserter and gotten himself a family of his own. The family is his wife, Sue, and his two adopted children. Basically... He didn't want to fight anymore because Sue had saved his life and he wanted to be with them, which is adorable. So that is basically where Hunter takes the group. And, well, they're there and it's so cute and the family's so good with Omega and they bond. And so basically Hunter's trying to think maybe Omega should stay with them because he doesn't know how to raise a child. I mean, she's not a child child, but she's still very young. And, well, he wants what's best for her. So, he tells Cut that maybe you should take care of Omega. And, well, Cut tells Hunter that he and his family are going to have to leave their planet and go into deeper hiding because of all this stupid stuff that the Empire is doing. So... That is the main goal of this particular episode. The Bad Batch are going to help Cut and his family escape. But in order to do that, they need this new thing that the Empire is developing. Basically, it's where they keep tabs on everybody in the galaxy. They're called chain codes. You can't get any payment 
or anything that'll lead you into... It's like an ID that we use, but a bit more restricting, if you ask me. So they have to forge some, because if they get the real thing, then they'll find out that Cut is a deserting clone and arrest him and do who knows what to him. So basically, that is where Tech comes in. He makes them four, or at least it was supposed to be four, but then eventually it becomes five fake chain codes to get them past the troops and onto the shuttle. And it was really cool because they did manage to make really good ones. In fact, they worked. And the person who had to deliver them to the group was Omega, and she did a fantastic job. She delivered them on time and with efficiency. And then she finds out about there being five instead of four, and Hunter tells her that that one's for her. And Hunter leaves to go help the Bad Batch because they had gotten discovered and they're trying to get back their ship. The only way they could make the chain codes was by letting their ship get tagged uh, because the people thought that it was like an abandoned ship. And now they have to get out of there. But I was like, no! No, no, no! Omega is like the jade of the group. Jade is a character from the show I used to really love called Jackie Chan Adventures. And I don't want her to leave. I want her to stay with the Bad Batch. Well, does she stay? Does Bad Batch escape? Well, you're going to have to watch the series in order to find that out. I completely recommend it. And that's coming from someone who really loves Star Wars. I love Star Wars The Clone Wars. I love Star Wars Rebels. I love all the Star Wars movies. And I give Bad Batch... A thumbs up rating. I am looking forward to the next couple of episodes. And I really, really am happy that this is what we're going to get until the new series on Disney Plus arrives. And that's Loki, which will be an awesome new Marvel series. It's just really a lot of fun to watch these characters interact and stuff. And I love the animation. It's the same kind of animation they use for Star Wars The Clone Wars. And it's just really a good show. And... I applaud everybody. By the way, the person who plays Sue is basically Kara Pifko as Sue. And, well, I just think that they're really good cast members, and I love the characters, and I give props to the people who developed it. It was created by Dave Bellani, and Disney Plus, you're doing very good with your streaming network, coming out with all kinds of new shows that are intriguing and cool, and you just, you keep surprising me. So, Disney Week has been a success. I liked the newest episode of Raven's House, Bad Batch was awesome, Falcon and the Winter Soldier was cool, and to Top it all off, another great show added to my list, Home Economics. Everybody's doing a fantastic job. And I'm glad that that's what I decided to do this week, because Disney always impresses, always makes you happy and hungry for more. (laughs) Anyway, now we need to discuss what's going to happen next week. I think next week should be Superhero Week. Because there's this new show on Netflix that I want to try called Jupiter Legacy, which looks really good. Not to mention, I want to talk about the newest episodes of DC Legends of Tomorrow, Supergirl, and Titans. Which is this really awesome series on the DC streaming network. Anyway, I hope that you all continue to have a good week. And I will see you next week. With superheroes galore fighting the good fight. See you then. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.